Good evening, fellow heretics. Welcome to a very special episode of Nerds and Heresy. I'm your host, Captain Dapple. Joining me in a very special guest co-host is Mr. Dave Warnock. How you doing today, Dave? Woo! Good to be here again. It's been a while. Yeah, Man, that a while. intro music had me banging my head. Right? Oh, Damn. My God. Oh. <laughs> a, a portion of my like money uh, the the money that i get from playing that audio clip goes to the original artist and it's like, so worth it oh cool i don't care um so yeah dave uh for those who don't know dave has a sort of outreach i guess i don't that know if that's very, the best word to use it sounds very evangelical uh yeah that's why i hate to use it <laughs> but uh, it's called Dying Out Loud, and there's a link to it in the description. Uh, Dave is doing phenomenal work for the, not just the atheist community, but the secular humanist community. Um, I highly check, recommend checking out everything that he's doing. Um, by the way, Dave, you have a story in your memoir, which mm -hmm. I have right here by happenstance. Yep. Uh, where you talk about because you were a pastor, an mm -hmm. evangelical pastor for like 20-something years-ish, right? Well, I was an evangelical Christian for 36 years. Many of those 36. years was on pastoral staff, church leadership, all kinds of different positions in church leadership. But I wasn't like one of these long-term long pastors for 30-something years. I don't want people to get that idea. I was no. in and out of the ministry, so to speak. So you weren't like raking in the dough, like oh yeah, no, no, uh, no, 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 nothing like that. <laughs> well, in any case, um, when you started asking questions for yourself and not accepting the answers to the, you know, the uh, uh, the other spiritual advisors that you looked up to that were giving you, um, right? You started looking the answers up to yourself. You went to a library mm -hmm. and you checked out some books. Mm -hmm. And in, in you tell the story in your book, the librarian was not too happy with um, some books that you checked out by a certain author. Do, do you remember? Who oh, that yeah. Was? Yeah. I, I took creative license with some parts of my book in terms of conversations I had and dialogue and things. So if you've read my book, Childish Things, available on Amazon everywhere. Um you you you'll Amazon see some conversations. You, you'll see some conversations that you know. Obviously, I couldn't remember verbatim thirty years ago. Just like the writers of the New Testament couldn't do that, but that's another story altogether. Hey, um, we might get into that with our guest. But um, yeah, this happened at a uh, at a public library in the suburbs of Nashville, Tennessee, a very conservative area of the country, and. Um, Oh, you shouldn't. Are you? You really want to check out that book? He's an atheist, is what this librarian told me, and I said, "Yes, I do. In fact, I'll be back for more of them." I was pissed. Nice. Well, that very author just happens to be waiting for us backstage. Um, what? Seriously? Right? He's I know. Here? Crazy. <laughs> um, real quick, before we bring him on, um, I know there's a lot of people who are watching who are going to going to want to ask him questions feel free uh super chats are going to get priority uh but even then i might not be able to get to them uh i only have him for an hour um and this is really something that i just i wanted to do for dave because for those who don't know dave has als he's not going to be with us for a whole lot longer um but he's a huge fan of dr bart Ehrman, so i thought this would be something nice i could do for him so this interview is going to be mostly focused on him and the questions he has that he wants to ask. So without further ado, hold on. Let me get to my intro and we're going to watch it and it's going to be super fun. Here we go. Hold on to your butts. Boom. All right. Welcome, everybody. Dr. Bart Ehrman, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well, thanks. How y'all doing? Hey, Bart. Good to Pretty see well. you, man. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ricky. How, how stoked are you, Dr. Uh, or Dave, to, to be speaking to Dr. Oh, it's Ehrman. so fun. Did you hear that story 
Uh, Bart, when you, you were backstage there. I did, yeah. You know, these Nashville librarians, you know. <laughs> Why do they even have the books? <laughs> no, no, she seriously, she did that. I took, I think, yeah. two of your books up to the counter with a couple of others. I was yeah. really just exploring uh, my deconstruction process. I was in the very beginning stages of it. And I, I was coming to the library for some, you know, what's out there? What I had no idea. Hmm. I did not know another atheist in the world. All I knew was Christians. And I thought, let, let me just see what's out there. I have no idea. And I came across yours. I looked at the notes. I thought, hmm, this looks interesting. Because my faith rested entirely on the, on the truth of the Bible. Um, it, it, it was, if the Bible was not true, then I was in trouble. I, I believed in an inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. And so when I saw your, your work and I thought, man, he's really, looks like this guy knows his shit. Let me just check him out. And I didn't know who you were, but I took it up to the to the librarian and she's just almost almost like a tisk tisk voice <laughs> says, do you really want to check these out? And she spit out the word. He's an atheist. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, I do. And I'll be back for more, probably. <laughs> and uh, I, I just I grabbed my books and stormed out of there. It really pissed me off. Well, you know, they were in her library. I mean, she, she's working in a library that has them. Presumably. Yeah, exactly. They want people to check them out. <laughs> yeah, why do you have them here if you're going to uh, diminish them? Exactly. Anyway, you have to that, approve of those books in the first place? Yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't asking my mom for permission. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it really, it really pissed me off. And, um, but no, I, I did. I, I devoured a couple of your books. I don't remember exactly. I think Misquoting Jesus was one of them. Um, but I really just, it, it, it really was the beginning of, of me, my eyes flinging wide open and saying, okay, wait a minute, this book has some serious problems. And mm. if this book has some serious problems, then my faith has some serious problems. Yeah. And truly, whenever I came to the conclusion, um, that the Bible was just a man-made document and it wasn't the word of God, it wasn't, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, then once that domino fell, the rest of the dominoes of my faith followed pretty quickly. Hmm. So thank you, Bart. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> thank you for ruining another soul. Yeah, thank you for creating yeah, another right. another demon here. Sending or more souls to hell. Congratulations. Right. Right. Well, it uh, meant more. You know, your your dissertation or your um, breakdown of of the New Testament meant a whole lot more to me, knowing your story. You know, where you came from, how you were evangelical, very pious and very um, uh, devout evangelical, uh, Moody. Uh, didn't you go to Moody and also yeah. Um, Wheaton? Yeah. Yeah. Wheaton, that's Wheaton was a step towards liberalism for me. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Billy but Graham's are, alma mater. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But those are those are um, two of the more uh, conservative evangelical schools in the country, aren't they? Well, I would say Moody is beyond evangelical i mean it's a fundamentalist school and it's right um, and it's um yeah it's pretty extreme but inerrancy rules the day there yeah and we were all we had the same thing with you i mean it's like you know the bible is no mistakes of any kind whatsoever and um you know for me that was also at the heart of my faith for years as well. yeah. yeah yeah and it was only when, when you went to that liberal school and got your doctorate that things the, the, the devil got his hooks in you then, right? <laughs> well, you know, so I went to Princeton Theological Seminary, and I, boy, I went in with my defenses up. The, those liberals weren't going to teach me anything. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it took me a few years before I started realizing, you know, actually, they got a pretty good argument here. I better, like, at least. And you know, what, I, I, what, I ended up, what I ended up thinking was that, look, if something's true, then it's on God's side. And so I wasn't thinking about leaving the faith. I was just thinking about leaving fundamentalism. You know, I see. I gonna, yeah. And so I, it was like, you know, if, if there's a contradiction in the Bible, there's a contradiction in the Bible, and it would be against God to say there's not, because if there is, then there, it's true <laughs> it's, that, that there is. And so, yeah, so, so I went a slightly different route. Not, I, I didn't go a different route from yours, but I, I took a longer route because I went from being a fundamentalist to being an evangelical to being a liberal evangelical to being a liberal. <laughs> and I got more and more liberal until finally, for reasons unrelated to my scholarship, unrelated to my biblical studies, mm -hmm. I've it all up. Yeah, I, I didn't stair step down like that. I yeah. <laughs> w w Once I realized the Bible wasn't what I thought it was, yeah. I just thought, well, I don't need any kind of faith then because if it's not... Hmm. true then what's the point of any of this yeah 
Because yeah. that's yeah. I got in, I kind of dove in as a Jesus freak in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I dove into the deep end of the pool. So when I got out, I dove out, you know, yeah. uh, I, I didn't stare step out. And yeah. it was pretty radical for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of the deal with me was that I was I was at a, a Presbyterian uh, seminary where virtually, you know, all my all the professors and many of my friends were were committed Christians, but they weren't fundamentalists and they didn't mm -hmm. think that the Bible was what fundamentalists said they said it was. And so they had no problem at all believing in Christ without thinking that the Bible was inerrant. And they thought that Fundament, they were as much of enemies of fundamentalists as as you and I are. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they're they're more our allies right now than they are yeah. enemies yeah. for sure. Yeah. When it comes to the Bible, absolutely. And, and fundamentalism, yeah. fundamentalism is yeah, the problem. Yeah. If you ask me, I mean that's yeah. that's the it's yeah, it's right. the issue of certainty for me that I have problem with. Yeah. yeah. Well, I tell people that you know people ask me, well, you know what what is, what does it actually mean fundamental fundamentalist and i tell them it just it, it's pretty simple it means no fun too much damn and not enough mental <laughs> <laughs> i've never heard that that's, that's, that's I haven't classic either. that's classic did you come up As with someone that? who is intimately familiar with her, with your work i'm surprised i have not heard that before <laughs> No yeah. fun. Yeah, that's great. No fun, that's too good. much damn, and not enough mental. <laughs> I, I myself went to the, um, the uh, I graduated from the University of Valley Forge from Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, uh, with a degree in biblical theology, which is a sister college of Liberty University. Huh. And I chose the major biblical theology. There's the most popular majors at that school was pastoral ministry and missions majors, but I wasn't really concerned about that. I was I I wanted to know about the Bible. I figured mm -hmm. biblical theology. Mm -hmm. Go for that. And once I understand the Bible, like the preaching, the pastoring, that would all come like learning on the job, I think. That would be easy. Uh so that's but that was one of the least popular majors. That's where you mm -hmm. learn Greek or Hebrew and everything. And that's what I went with. And yeah, my education led me to be like, hmm, okay, this is interesting. Hmm. Uh, so I learned a lot of things that, you know, gave me questions, just like yeah. the AFC do. Um, and I followed that rabbit trail, and ultimately now I'm an atheist. But uh, I became acquainted at, well after I graduated with your work, Dr. Ehrman. Mm -hmm. I didn't even hear about you while I was in college. Oh, boy. One of my oh. kids. Are... <laughs> I have four kids. They're wife. My wife oh. is on. She's on it. Um, but Dr. Ehrman, I wanted to get into your latest book. Okay. You are you are quite prolific in your writing, Bart. I mean, you put out about a book a year, maybe over two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so your, wow. your, latest, your latest book is called Armageddon, um, which I have read. And I've read most of your books. All but like four or five of them, maybe. And I, I, I love your work. Your very your writing style is very. Um, you appeal to the common audience. You don't have to be a scholar yeah. to understand what you're writing. It's mm -hmm. easy to understand. It's straightforward, and I, I just love it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very approachable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This book easily is like in like the top five of your books. Like, it's it's really good. Well, I'll tell you, my opinion is, it's, I mean, you know, they're like your children. You're not supposed to love one more than the other. But as an author, your best book is always the most recent one. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so, I was, was going to say, that. probably so. So this is my best book um, by far. <laughs> not an author myself, but I have heard that. Just better than um, Heaven and Hell, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, look, it's light years. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven and Hell was really good. And by the way, you, you use the same, like, uh, the cover art. Uh, the artist uh -huh. is the same artist that used uh, really? for Heaven and Hell. Uh, is, which is I, it? Well. I didn't know that. Because <laughs> I have no choice in the, I mean, they asked me, is this okay? <laughs> they give me some choices and I choose. Oh, right? you the don't publisher. get a choice? The publisher chooses that, right? Yeah, the publisher chooses mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. And the title. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You, you I lose to, almost every argument I have about you title. get to sign off on it though, right? I mean, you get to, uh, well, they pretend that I they, they pretend that you have a voice I mean, in it, basically. Right. <laughs> Armageddon's a pretty arresting title, I will say. Well, yeah, I wanted I think they, 
Did it's you much well. better than what I was coming up with. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I wanted you... to call it something like uh, expecting Armageddon. And they said, uh, you know, it's better just to have the, just punch it. Just Armageddon. punch it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think they're probably right. I think it, it yeah. really grabs you. Armageddon. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's the word. And I, I wonder how many non-evangelicals know what that word means. Well, I think it's in common parlance, but maybe they don't, they may not know that it's referring to, you know, an incident in the book of Revelation, but the idea of Armageddon seems to be one of these things that kind of crept into the common par- parlance. And yeah, there was a popular movie by that name, right? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is in the nomenclature of, of the culture, but they yeah. may not know it's a biblical thing. They just no. know it's some kind of end times battle or something. Yeah. They don't think revelation 19. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. Right. So I wanted to start by reading an excerpt from your book. I have highlighted here, actually two of them. Uh, so give me a second. Cause I think this is going to start off the conversation really well. You said, um, the God of revelation is not all knowing, not even close, neither is the Christ of Revelation. They favor only Jesus' devoted followers, and others are tormented and are horribly destroyed, including many Christians, those whom John considered lukewarm in their faith and misguided in the following uh, practices he disagrees with. All are tossed into the lake of fiery. Continue on. Next page. If the book of Revelation had been left out of the canon of Scripture, would Christians be so uh, invested in saying that there is nothing wrong with accepting this vengeful, jealous God of violent wrath portrayed here? This is a question that I've wrestled with for a, a, a lot, because the, the the book of Revelation almost did not make it into the New Testament. And I often wonder, what would Christianity look like today if it had not? Mm-hmm. Like this apocalyptic imagery, it would be easy to say that, hey, yeah, the New Testament God is peaceful and loving and merciful, but the book of Revelation is sort of what like puts the New Testament on par with the Old Testament God. So, Dr. Ehrman, what do you think Christianity would look like today if, yeah, if if Revelation was not ultimately added into the New Testament? Yeah, it's a really good question because, uh, you know, I've, I people frequently tell me that the Old Testament God is a God of wrath and the New Testament God is a God of love. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, and I then I always respond by asking them, when is the last time you read the book of Revelation? <laughs> if you want a God of wrath. <laughs> but yeah. what, I, what I also say in my book is that both, I think both parts of that equation are problematic because the Old Testament God is not just a God of wrath. He, he, he's also a God of love. I mean, the idea, you know, the, the two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. That's from the Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's from the Old Testament. And there's a lot of love in the Old Testament. But the problem in the Old Testament generally is that God's people disobey him. And he's not just a loving God, but a just God. And in many ways... He goes uh, to extremes. <laughs> yeah. Some of us would think we're a little bit much. Uh, and so I, I give some examples of that in, in my book. It's, it's funny because people, of course, they know about things like the destruction of, the, of Jericho, although they don't pay attention much when they Christians, when they see that with the destruction of Jericho, when the walls come a tumbling down, uh, the Israelites are the ordered to go down. in and kill every man, woman and child child in the city yeah so but i actually come up with i I point out to even more violent places in the old testament than that but the book of revelation is worse than any of it you know it's not killing the people in a town it's killing you know the vast majority of people who've ever lived by throwing them alive into a lake of burning sulfur this is god doing this Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, it's, so what would new, what would Christianity be without this? The New Testament uh, doesn't have anything like this kind of violence and vengeance, this sanctioning of um, of, uh, of uh, opposition to the enemy to the point of torturing them. People get tortured by God in this book. Uh, you know, you don't get anything like that in in the New Testament. You certainly in the New Testament do get the idea that the end is coming soon, and you need to repent because. You know, you'll be destroyed. But when God destroys people, like the teachings of Jesus or in Paul, he just destroys them. 
he doesn't torture them for five months and then you know and then throw them. <laughs> it's like, this is yeah. this is uh, this is not. So I think I think that the it would be a different religion in many ways. And I think one one of the things I end the book with, I think you're reading something near the end of my book, is that. You know, this this view of Jesus is not the view of Jesus you get in the New Testament Gospels. And I don't think Jesus would have considered this person to be faithful to his own message. This person, of course, John of Patmos thinks he's he's a, he's, he's a Christian and he, he know, he's an avid Christian. But, man, I don't think Jesus would have recognized him as one of his followers. Yeah. I, 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 how do you think it made it into the canon? I mean, what were they were they looking for a God of wrath in order to instill fear? By that time, he got in for kind of a, a reason you wouldn't expect, and it had trouble getting in for a reason you wouldn't expect. <laughs> and so, there, you know, we read this and we say, "Oh my God, why is that in the New Testament?" And you know, it's because all this wrath and violence and blood and vengeance and stuff. And that wasn't a problem in early Christianity. The problem in early Christianity for this book, for the church leaders who were not sure about it or who didn't want it in, was that at the end, when God destroys everybody else. He gives his followers a city of gold uh, with gates of pearl, and it's a luxurious existence for all time where they dominate everybody on the planet and they get, every, you know, just one banquet after the other kind of thing. And the church fathers at the time when they were deciding which books would be in were completely opposed to Christians indulging in the pleasures of the flesh um, because they thought that. We shouldn't be concerned about bodily pleasure. We should be concerned about spiritual realities. Mm -hmm. And in heaven, it's going to be all about spiritual realities. It's not going to be about big banquets every night. And so they were opposed to it because it didn't have a strict uh, ethical code, in their opinion. Uh, that's not the reason people today oppose it. The reason it ended up getting in, though, is for a completely unrelated reason. In the fourth century, when it finally people basically agreed it had to be in, fourth and fifth centuries, the big issue in Christianity at the time was a theological issue about whether Christ was a was God because God had made him in the past at some time, in the eternity past. God had generated his son so that Christ was a, a, subor a subordinate being to God the Father, mm -hmm. or whether Christ was equal with God the Father. Council of Nicaea, was he, 3, yeah, 325? 325. So it comes about, it comes to a head at the Council of Nicaea in 325. But the, the issue continues on even after that. And so this debate, is he equal or not? And the book of Revelation proved really useful for the winning side because the book of Revelation, uh, God identifies himself several times as he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know, so the first letter of the alphabet, the last last letter. I'm the I'm beginning and end, Alpha and Omega. And Jesus himself identifies himself as the Alpha and the Omega. So he also is the beginning and the end. And so church fathers could use that to say, so they're equal. Hmm. Uh, and so this book could verify not just that Jesus was God in some sense, but that he was equal with God. And so it was useful theologically. Yeah. What do you the, think? I mean, John wrote it, right? Is that pretty clear? Well, somebody named John wrote it. What's not right. clear is which John he was. Mm -hmm. uh, so already in early Christianity, in the third century, we have a Christian intellectual named Dionysius, who's a bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, who wrote a treatise that we still have that proves that the author of uh, the book of Revelation named John was not the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. Yeah. He I proves it on linguistic grounds. Yeah. I'd heard that. Now, so what do you think? I mean, sit, go back in your mind. If you could put yourself in the place of, of John, whoever, who, whichever John wrote the book of Revelation, what was his goal? What was actually, was he on some mushroom trip? I mean, what's happening we here? We hear that a lot. Yeah. What, what do you think's happening here as he writes this fantastical acid trip of a book? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, when you read Revelation, if you're not if you're not used to this kind of literature, <laughs> you read yeah. this and say, "Wow, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen." Yeah, and, and it is. It is, and you know, and well, back and then it, and, it wasn't that weird, actually. 
Well, that's what I'm going to say is that oh, it's okay. not, it's weird for us. And it seems like he's on some kind of acid trip or something. But the reality is that, so, so when historians read this, when historians mm-hmm. read the book of Revelation and they're, they're trained in ancient literature, they recognize it right off the bat as being a kind of writing that was fairly widespread in Jewish and Christian circles at the time. Mm-hmm. Scholars have collected these various things and they call them apocalypses. And, just like every every kind of genre of literature, every kind of literature has kind of rules for how you write it. And so short stories are one thing, and limerick poems are a different thing, and science fiction novels are a different thing, and a sonnet is a different thing. And so like they all have their kind of rules. And apocalypses, this is the only apocalypse we have in the New Testament, but there we have we have others from the ancient world. And so we can kind of see how they work. And once you see how they work, it demystifies each one of them, because you kind of say, oh, yeah, that's what he's doing. And so I think what John is doing, uh, to, put, to put it in the shortest tr- sense, what I, what I, are, what I show in my, try to show in my book is that the historical reading is almost certainly right, that scholars have long had, which is that John is writing a set of visions that he's had or he's imagining having that are meant to show that God is soon going to intervene to overthrow the uh, Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. He's going to dis- the, the enemy, the Antichrist, is the city of Rome and its emperor, uh, the Roman emperor, and that uh, that God uh, thinks that uh, they're evil, and he got, he's going to destroy them, and he's going to give all the power and all the wealth uh, to the Christians. And hmm. so the followers of Jesus need to be faithful to him because they're going to inherit the earth um, if they if they remain passionately faithful. So 2,000 years later, we're still waiting for this. <laughs> still waiting. Baby, it's coming next Thursday. So, Dave, Eating. I don't know if you were into this, but in the 70s, when I was a, when I was a conservative evangelical, we were all convinced that the end was coming by the end of 19, by, by 1988. Yeah, yeah, the, four, the generation from the fig tree. Andrew Wiseman has entered the chat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the in, before, generation shall not pass since Israel, the yeah. fig tree, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Lindsay, you know, how Lindsay's book, Late Great Planet Late Earth. Late Great Planet Earth, one of the first books I ever read as a Christian. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, for many of us, it was the 28th book of the New Testament. <laughs> it yeah, was like, this is an inspired word of God. <laughs> pretty much, that, yeah. That laid out exactly what's going to happen in the Middle East. And this, you know, Israel is going to do this. Then the Arab states going to do that. Then the Europeans are going to come in. Then Russia is going to get involved. Then China, bombs are going to fly. Then Jesus comes back. And he had this all worked out in detail. And it had to happen before 1988. And we just well, believed yeah, it. <laughs> I, I was so con- I got I got caught up in the Jesus movement in in the early seventies, um, mm-hmm. late seventy three, early seventy four, mm-hmm. and I was so convinced that the end was so close that I put off going to college and mm-hmm. put off any kind of any kind of meaningful career mm-hmm. because I had to witness and get to the streets and do the coffee yeah. house yeah. ministry because yeah. I needed to save souls. It was yeah. that. Yeah. It was that urgent for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was with you on that. Do you remember that bumper sticker, uh, Dave, where the, the uh, bumper sticker back there that said, in case of rapture, this car will be You're abandoned? Really empty. <laughs> but, but, I you know, had one. I had one. I had one, too. But but later I saw a bumper <laughs> oh sticker that said, said uh, warning. <laughs> in, the later bumper sticker said, warning, in case of rapture, I want your car. <laughs> no, I didn't see that one. <laughs> That's the kind I want. Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, that that was a classic bumper sticker. Hey, this is beyond then. my time now. You, yeah, yeah, we're going that. back in the seventies. <laughs> I mean, because because that was the. You remember those um, David Wilkerson movies? Um, the uh, what were they called? The Thief in the Night. Thief in the Night. Yeah, that was okay. the idea that that yeah. the rapture was going to happen, yeah. and cars <laughs> would be would be barreling down the highway, and people yeah. would all of a sudden be gone, and there'd be mass accidents and chaos. Yeah. And it was just going to be wild and crazy. And that was the thought that was, well, you know, just every, every, every late teenager in the seventies who was a, who who was a born again Christian saw that movie about 20 times. Oh yeah. And just about everyone I know uh, had a very bad experience as a result of that movie of like coming home after school one day and the house being empty and thinking they had been left behind. Yeah. Yeah. Terrified. I got left behind. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> that's it's traumatic for a kid. I mean, it's my traumatic. God, it's yeah, that's, you, yeah, yeah, that's horrible. Anyway, yeah. sidetrack. <laughs> Bumper stickers and raptures. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's not really a sidetrack because in my book, I tried, I tried to show in my book that um, this doctrine of the rapture is not in the Book of Revelation, and in fact, it's nowhere in the Bible. 
and I show where it came from because we can date it. Thessalonians, right? That's well, what that's what they to. say, but it's yeah. not. It doesn't First Thessalonians four isn't talking about that, right. and so the first person to come up with this idea was a guy named John Newman Darby, and I we can that, date yeah. it eighteen thirty three. Is 1833 is the first time anybody came up with the idea of a rapture. And then it took over, took over evangelical Christianity. It really didn't take over funda fundamentalism until the 20th century. And then, and now everybody just assumes that's what the book of Revelation teaches <laughs> because fundamentalists have, fundamentalists have said it teaches that. Mm -hmm. and it, it absolutely doesn't. There's nothing about the rapture in the book of Revelation. Nothing. No. Well, there was, in my, in my circles, there was, Conflicting ideas between post-trib rapture and pre-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture, those kind of oh, those kind of yeah. post-tribulation, pre-tribulation, those kind of things. Yeah. So there was a yeah. there were arguments about what what was yeah. what, but most people believed in a snatching away of the saints suddenly without warning. Yeah, and then and yeah. then everything else followed that. Yeah, you could have arguments, but you know, and, and there was there were heated arguments about that. Is it before the oh, tribulation? Yeah. Halfway oh through? yeah, oh yeah. I I heard one. I heard Jack Van Impey, who was one of these prophecy guys. Oh yeah, I remember him years and years. I heard him at a give a talk where he said that he was so pre-trib that he wouldn't eat post toasties. <laughs> did, did he, he said that as a joke. I hope. Yeah, yeah, it was a joke. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. So yeah, that's uh, that's that's some crazy stuff. It it takes me back. Um, I was all in. I believed it. I believed it for a lot of years. A lot of people still believe it. Like any day now, it's going to happen. Oh no, the mi millions of people believe it now. Still, you know the the Left Behind series, the novel series. Yeah. That um, Timothy LaHaye uh, and Philip Jenkins wrote. When Timothy LaHaye died, I had a some years a few years ago now, there had been eighty million copies of, the, of these things sold. Just he like, made a lot of money off. He, he, he was just a regular old pastor until he came up with that idea. Well, before that, he was writing books about how to have uh, Christian sex. Yeah, yeah. He and his wife, Beverly, uh, yeah. because Christians were always kind of a little, little concerned about, like, you know, what's, what's appropriate, and you're like, what, what can't we do? And they, <laughs> <laughs> they let it rip and said, yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah. People like oh, that book, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Irma, you talked about in your book how um, – the book of Revelation is cyclical. It's not linear, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. It's not a new view. It's a common view among historians. It's the view found in our very earliest um, commentary on Revelation, back uh, written in, uh, in the year 280, <laughs> but, but the cyclical thing. And the way it works is when you read Revelation, um, the, the disasters start in uh, chapter five. Uh, Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God, is, is given a scroll by God, and the scroll is sealed with seven seals, and he breaks a seal on the scroll, which is, I guess, describing the future of Earth, and he breaks the first seal, and a disaster, oh my God, a horrible war breaks out on Earth, breaks the second seal, starvation, and, and, like, and every seal, and after the seven seals, the seventh seal introduces seven angels that have seven trumpets, and they blow, each one blows a trumpet, more disasters on Earth. The seventh trumpet introduces seven angels carrying bowls of God's wrath on their shoulders that they pour out on the Earth, and more disasters. So it goes on for 11 chapters, disaster after disaster after disaster. So what I show in my book is what scholars have long recognized, that this can't be a linear progression. Mm -hmm. It can't be it can't be a chronological sequence of events. And the reason is because when um, at, at one point, um, at one point within this, these disasters, the uh, there's a, the disaster is that the sun turns dark, the moon turns to blood, the stars fall from the sky, the sky rolls up like a scroll. And so, you know, the, the universe is ending now. Or you think it is, but you're only in chapter six. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you've, got, you've got 16 more Not chapters of this to go. <laughs> and so it can't, be, it can't be understood as a linear thing. And so what happens in these apocalypses is that you tend to get this kind of thing where it's, it's um, it, some people think of it as kind of a spiral, kind of it's spiraling, but it's not a straight, it's not a straight line because um, it just doesn't work as, as a straight line. And so the point is, is that if you, if you do that kind of rep, rep, uh, that repetitive thing, it makes the point. And the point's pretty clear. All hell's going to break out down here. And so it's not a literal description of a linear set of events. 
Hmm. Is this a similar like literary function as what you see in like Genesis and Exodus where it's retelling the same story over and over again? I would say it's a little bit different because uh, in in like Genesis, for example, you get in chapter one, you get a creation account. In chapter two, you get a different creation account. And when you actually compare them in detail, it doesn't work. No, (laughs) but but that's because the uh, the person who put together Genesis had two sources that each told a creation story and he wanted to include both of them. So he put them right next to each other. In John's case, it looks like this is a composition that's designed to, to be this way. It's designed to be a, a, a um, you know, a repetitive uh, sequence. So, and it's, you know, so it's three, a se- sequence of three, each with seven disasters. So these yeah. are symbolic numbers, obviously. So my, my next question is going to be um, a, a popular claim that I've made myself and as well as many other edgy internet atheists is that uh, Revelation was written in a way to um, disguise its intentions from the Roman authorities, which you address mm-hmm. in your book. Yeah. Um, how would uh, the readers of this book recognize this as being cyclical? How, how or would they? How would they know this was cyclical and mm-hmm. not linear? Like, is it was this a common? Yeah, literary yeah. genre in their time that they were yeah. like, oh yeah, this is that style yeah. of writing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in my book, I argue that it's not meant to be uh, as mystifying as it is to us. The people in antiquity, Christians would have understood a lot of the symbolism that that we have to work a little bit harder to figure out. But the, the, it's an interesting question about the cyclical thing. Um, we don't know how the earliest readers read it. Um, John writes this book to Christians who are in the seven churches of Asia Minor. These are seven churches along the western coast of what is now uh, Turkey. Uh, and he's so he's writing it directly to this audience. It's, he's not writing this for us. He's writing for these churches in his day. And we have no record of how they read it. Um, our earliest record of it, of how somebody's reading this catastrophe sequence, is in a commentary by a guy named uh, Victorinus in the third century. And he does understand it as cyclical. And he, he explains really? why it has to be cyclical. So the reason we think that probably people originally read it as cyclical is because this is a kind of thing that you find in other apocalypses. Mm. And if people understood how the genre works, um, they would have understood that this isn't a linear description. Just like if somebody today reads a science fiction novel, you know, about a, a bacterium that's escaped the lab in New York City and has poisoned the water of the entire water supply of New York City. When they read that, they understand it, that this is a science fiction novel and they know where it's going to go, you know, because they understand how the genre works. If they read so, it on the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> they have a completely different because they understand how that genre works. And so if you understand the apocalypse genre, then you, you know this pretty well. So, so what, what I hear you saying, Dr. Herman, is that ancient authors understood this, is, this genre better than modern day 2000 years later readers understood it well modern day readers don't even know there's a genre <laughs> i mean right the, the apocalypse i mean when we read it when we were when we were I mean, dave you might have been like this too i mean when i was a fundamentalist i read it i said oh my god this is like this is so weird and bizarre no human could come up with this this must be inspired by god. oh yeah totally <laughs> it was one of the first books of the bible i read as a christian i thought i want to go right to the meat of this thing this is exciting really? oh. i can't wait yeah yeah you went really? straight to revelation oh you poor soul Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. I thought huh. this is for this looks fun. Let me get into this. Oh God! I had just the opposite reaction. I, really? Well, I was going off to. So I was, I was I was seventeen. I graduated from high school. I was going off to Moody, and I I knew that they had an entrance exam, and I had read all the rest of the New Testament, but I just couldn't bring myself to read Revelation because I just I started to. I said, Oh my God, this is just too weird. It's like a and drug so trip thought, without the drugs. Well, I know. And it's, you know, it's one of the safest way to blow your mind without exactly. you know, breaking the law. <laughs> and so, so, so I decided, so okay, God, I got to read it. So I, so I read it and I, oh God, I have no, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> and well, I didn't know either. It just was like a, a good fun movie. You know, I thought, well, God's exciting. My whole, my whole uh, appeal, Christianity's appeal to me was the excitement of it. It was something that yeah. I could be a part of that was bigger than me. This is something going on yeah. that's that's yeah. powerful and, and incredible 
Yeah, and that's what drew me in. And Revelation yeah, right. was every bit of that. Well, it is because it it has the secrets, right? It, yeah, yeah. It's revealing what's going to, and so that's a very powerful way to read it. And then you know that you've got it. I'm in on this. Know, I'm in on the big. I'm the big plan, man. I'm 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 one of the winners here. You're one of the winners, and you know the guy next door doesn't get it. And yeah. sorry for him. It's Poor like a sucker. fire for him. Yeah. But you know, look, I'm. Gonna, yeah, I warned <laughs> I you. I warned you, gold. man. I, I gave you the good news. You didn't receive it. Yep. Shake the dust right. off my feet and move on. Yep. Um, yep. I got a question about, about eternal eternal life. Um, you know, you're talking about revelation and all the end time stuff there. Your average Christian on the street today, if he's talking about, um, I can't wait to get to heaven and see my mom. Yeah. You know, um, I, I get a lot of this language in the ALS community because we're all dying and everybody's can't wait to yeah. get, get to heaven and see their loved one. Right. But if you look at Revelation, you got a new heaven and a new earth. You got a new Jerusalem. Uh, you got heaven up in the clouds somewhere because that's where Jesus floated up to. What What do you think Christians who really study this stuff and think about it? Because your average Christian doesn't. Um, what do you think they come up with when they picture where this eternal life is going to be? Is it in heaven? Is it a new heaven and new earth? Is it a new Jerusalem? Is it a golden street? What do you think they they think? How, how do really, they put this together? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. My sense is most Christians don't put it together at all. Theologians have a way of putting it together. But uh, I completely agree with you. Everybody, every Christian I know who, who isn't a scholar just, just thinks that what the New Testament teaches is that you die and your soul goes to heaven. Yeah. Uh, and that's not what Revelation teaches at all. It is very explicit. The um, the um, the New Jerusalem descends from heaven onto earth. Right. It's an enormous city. It's fifteen hundred miles cube, <laughs> and it's so it's fifty miles high, fifteen hundred miles wide, long, and it's all it's all gold, gold yeah. gates of pearl, and that's where the followers of Jesus are going to live forever on earth in this New Jerusalem. So they're ruling the earth. Uh, and that is the that's the older Christian view is that mm -hmm. the view of Jesus was that the kingdom of God is coming to earth. It's a kingdom. It's a real right. kingdom here yeah. on earth. A new and heaven and Paul a new thought. earth. Right. But so what ends up happening eventually is that um, both Jesus and Paul and the book of Revelation all talk about it coming soon. Mm -hmm. And when it didn't come soon, people started thinking, well, what's going to happen to me then? You know, I mean, if do I going to be in my grave for 2000 years? What? And so they started thinking that, in fact, eternal life isn't this life on this earth after a resurrection of the dead. It's when you die, your soul, your soul separates from your body and goes to heaven. That is so my book, Heaven and Hell, is about that. It's about yeah. how we got from this idea of a kingdom of God on earth to a heaven and a hell which is not found in the New Testament. Heaven and hell are not in the New Testament. But so the problem so the problem you're dealing with Dave is that Christians have accepted this idea of heaven and hell, but they also have within their their teachings the idea of a future resurrection of the dead and the coming of the new Jerusalem on earth. Most Christians never never even think that this is a contradiction. No, they don't. <laughs> and, and it's blatantly a contradiction. It can't be both, but right. Theologians have ways of dealing with it. You know, some theologians will say things like, um, well, some will say that Revelation's being metaphorical. I, I'm not talking uh -huh. about evangelicals. I'm not talking about, you know, fundamentalists. I'm talking about, you know, serious, serious theologians who are very, serious theologians are really quite sophisticated philosophers. Right. So they, they know all this. So right. but they, they might think of it as a kind of a metaphorical description of the future. Or some more kind of literally minded would say things like, you know, you die and your soul goes to heaven, but then after the resurrection, you come back and you re-inhabit the earth. Is that um, kind of how you make sense of it? Yeah. That's how you would make sense of it. Yeah. I, I, I kind of figured they had to fit the pieces together some way because they yeah. really don't fit in, don't in any fit. logical <laughs> way. You've got to really force fit them. Well, and even Christians, you know, who are in traditional churches that say the Nicene Creed, you know, Ricky mentioned the, you know, the Council of Nicaea in 325, the, the creed that came out of that at the very end of it says that I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Christians say that and nobody has a clue what they even mean by it. Right. Because resurrection of the dead is not your soul going to heaven. The resurrection of the dead is that your body comes back to life and you have eternal life here on earth. <laughs> and it's kind of a mixed Christians message. That. It's, it's a mixed message. <laughs> it's a mixed message. It's all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Matthew 20 or 22, was it? 
Um, for which? The resurrection. Oh, the, the grave wow. opens up and the... Oh, the grave I, opens up. Oh, yeah. That's when yeah. Jesus dies. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Right. All the people wander around Jerusalem yeah, like yeah, a bunch of zombies. And they just start walking around. Walking around. <laughs> huh. Oh. A little sight, sightseeing. Oh, my goodness. Um... I think he has some questions in the chat, Ricky. Do I? I saw I one or two. I've been paying attention to the questions in the channel. Sorry. Well, I didn't catch them. Distracted. So you, Bart, you're at UNC sure. in Chapel Hill, right? That's right. Um, you, I, you chair the religion department? or I did for a long time, but I, I'm not now. I'm So I've been here since 1988. And um, it's a little bit weird, really, because I started I my education. I was born two years before that. <laughs> Two years before that. <laughs> like, I want to hear that? <laughs> Last yeah. semester, I taught you're a class. You're going to hear it, Dr. Irvin. You're going to hear it. <laughs> I hear it all the time. Last semester, I taught a class with 15 students. And at the end of the semester, two of them came up to me and said, my father had you in class here. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so what, what Don't worry, the, I'll be there one day and I'll feel that pain. What are the classes you're teaching? You're teaching New Testament? What are you teaching? Basically. Well, so I, for, for almost all my time here, I've, um, half of my courses have been uh, undergraduate classes on the New Testament, the historical Jesus, the Gospels, things like that. Uh, and the other half have been PhD uh, seminars, training PhD students. Those would, so my undergraduate classes typically were like 350 students or something. Uh, and my PhD seminars would be like six students. Yeah, I see. But the six were that those PhD seminars were so much harder to teach. Oh, really? Uh, oh, God. No, because you know, you're reading texts in Greek, and these are like serious people who are advanced in their education. Yeah. And they, they know a lot of things you don't know, and you know, they're learning. And, just, and so it's just hard. It's really hard. Um, but what you know, what I was going to say is, is it's a little bit strange because my first teaching job was at Rutgers in New Jersey mm -hmm. um, while I was finishing my PhD. Um, my you know, I went to Moody, I went to Wheaton, I went to Princeton Theological Seminary for both a master's and a PhD. The first time I ever set foot in a secular uh, university or college classroom was the day I started teaching in one. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, that's the thing about I'm curious about because I live in I'm a neighbor of yours. I live in Charlotte and um, <laughs> North Carolina is fairly conservative. And a lot of I would imagine a lot of your students that come to UNC would be coming from Christian households. Yes. And what did you, have you found over the years that you've kind of blown their minds and kind of, I don't know, want to say ushered them out of the faith, huh. but at least got them thinking differently about it. Have oh, you seen yeah. that happen over the years? Maybe. Yeah. So I, the thing is that I, I, you know, my students, it's kind of self-selecting because most students know kind of what I'm about. I uh, would think they yeah. take my class, but, but I tell them, look, I am not interested in deconverting you. Uh, or right. converting you. I'm not, you know, this is not a religious, it's not a religious class. It's about religion, but I'm not embracing a particular religion here. This is a class about history. What, you know, what did, what did Jesus really say and do, for example? How, who wrote the gospels? Did Paul write all of his letters? These are, these are like historical questions and the historical conclusions that I reach, you don't have to reach. I tell them, you know, if you got different conclusions, you know, then argue for them, but argue for them historically, That's not good. because of your faith. Yeah. And so what ends up happening, I, I don't encourage people to change their beliefs, but I do encourage people to become thoughtful believers. So if you're going to stick with your faith, at least, you know, know something about it because the opposite of being an informed believer is to be an ignorant believer and who wants to be ignorant <laughs> and so what ends up happening is i very rarely have students during the semester you know leave the faith um like it if it does happen i never hear about it right but uh, but what typically happens is about five or six years later yeah. especially the students who were like the most ardent opponents of mine who really were just couldn't buy it. You know, uh, about five or six years later, I'll get an email <laughs> saying, you know, Dr. Ehrman, <laughs> you got me thinking. Yeah. You well, got me thinking. Start, you planted a seed. I'm sorry. No, you planted, you planted a, seed a seed on fertile soil. A seed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little mm -hmm. mustard seed. It's a small seed, but yeah. it grows into a big bush. <laughs> No, that's and I can see where that would happen, and I, I really appreciate your approach to it. I've I've I said the same thing in my the work that I do online is I'm not trying to change anyone's mind. I'm just trying to help people think more critically about what yes. they what they believe and why. And yeah. 
And whatever you come to from that is good, but at least you'll be thinking differently. You're not just following an indoctrination. That's it. That's exactly it. And so many people just want an authority to tell them what to think. Exactly. Both, you know, religiously and politically in our world. And, um, and scientifically, I mean, oh, just every preach. way you just want somebody to tell preach, you. To believe. John Herman. <laughs> <laughs> and politically. Oh yeah, no, I'm sorry to say, but, uh, you know, I, I just, um, you know, there are smart people on, uh, on virtually every divide. Uh, but there are, um, there are a lot of brainwashed people and it's, it seems that uh, at least in my experience, in my part of the world, a lot of the brainwashed people do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Um, and people They're who are open to ideas, who want to think, you know, who are excited. willing to consider other things, they they tend to be uh, people who are not out to kind of destroy others. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that's that's a fair assessment, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I don't know what to make of it. Like you have like in in modern day political discourse, you have like the the assaults against the trans community. You have trans people who are just trying to live their life. They're not doing. They're not hurting anybody. And then you have people who are just out there like, hey, we should kill all of those people. It's literally what people are saying. And they're just like, why? We're not, we're not yeah. doing anything. We're just living our life. So, Well, you know, the thing is you can use the book of Revelation for that, um, that kind of approach where you, I mean, in, in the Gospels, Jesus says to, uh, to love your enemy, to do good for those who harm you, turn the other cheek, uh, don't pay back evil for evil, et cetera, et cetera, but love your enemy. And um, Jesus, so that's what his view was. The Christ in Revelation is out to destroy everybody who disagrees with him. He's, everybody yeah. who takes another side. He's so it, different. It's a different, but if you're a, if you're he a, got He got angry, didn't he? Oh my God. No, Revelation itself says that it's about the wrath of God and yeah. the wrath of the Lamb. The flaming sword coming out of his mouth. I mean, what's that about? Yeah, well, uh, in chapter 14, he uses that flaming sword. Um, or at the at I guess in the in chapter 19 of the Battle of Armageddon, he uses that flaming sword to to slaughter his enemies. Mm -hmm. And then they end up getting cast, you know, they brings them back to life and then he throws them into a lake of burning sulfur. <laughs> so that if you the thing is that if, if that's your model for what Christ is, then you have no trouble slaughtering people who are different from you yeah, yeah. because you think they're unnatural and only people like me are on Christ's side. And so, you know, kill the trans and, you know, but you know, the other thing, Ricky, about this is, you know, it's not just trans, obviously, but you know, all of the social issues today that conservative evangelical Christians support because the Bible says so, um, Boy, I mean that's it's really problematic. Oh, it yeah. is, I uh, there are a lot a lot of scholars have shown that what we think of as homosexuality isn't even in the Bible. No, and abortion not is aware. definitely not in the Bible. There is not a word about abortion <laughs> in the Bible. And but you know they just assume you go out to a Planned Parenthood where people are lined up and you know protesting, and it's because the Bible says that you're you know that that. God forms you in the womb and they're just not reading the text. Yeah. Uh, they don't understand. They don't, so because the they don't have Jeremiah. knowledge. I'm sorry. Only. So that, that verse is talking about the prophet Jeremiah only like that was the idea at the time. Well, it wasn't just that, but it's that the, what the prophet says, Moses, I mean, the, these, these lines say before I was in my mother's womb, you knew me. Okay. What is that really saying then? If you're really taking it literally, it means that you pre-existed your birth. Do yeah. you think you pre-existed your birth? Do you think you lived before you were born? Ooh. These people would say, no, no, that's reincarnation. Oh, that, that's good. If you take the verse, <laughs> that the verse does not say, I made you a human being in the womb. It okay, says, I knew you before you were in the womb. <laughs> and so you can just go passage by passage and just show oh, yeah. that these things, these people, they, they assume it says something because somebody told them that's what it says and they don't even think about it. They don't look at it and think about it. Hey, yeah. I did see a super chat. Uh, Ricky, did you see it uh, from greater candle? He had a, he had a question for yes, Mark. Yes. Yes. Thank yeah, you. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, wasn't the belief in the Trinity uh, only finalized after Constantinople was founded and Arianism was the attitude of Constantine the Seconds. 
Right. So um, this is a little, a, little uh, off topic, but yeah. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. So I, I, in my book, The Triumph of Christianity, I actually talk about this issue at some length. You do. It's a very you do important, indeed. very important issue, and. Um, so all all I'll say about it right now is that uh, there are some big terms in the in the question that are uh, that need to be explained. Arian is Arianism in very simple terms is this belief that Christ is God, but he's subordinate to God the Father, that he can't be equal with God. I mean, God's God's God, and Christ is the Son of God, so he's not as powerful. Um, that's the view that was debated at the Council of, of Nicaea, as we said, in the year three twenty five, and. Uh, at the Council of Nicaea, it was decided that no, he's not a subordinate divinity, he's he's equal. But the Council of Nicaea did not debate the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity uh, was a debate that went on uh, for a while for a while longer. Um, and um, there were th- this this uh, this questioner is right. After Constantine himself died, he 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 had three sons who survived. Uh, the 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 other relatives of Constantine, male relatives, didn't survive because mm-hmm. the, the three sons slaughtered them. Yeah, but, but um, good Christian men. They were yeah, Christian. right. They were Christians, but they they slaughtered them. And and um, throughout the fourth century, these these um, children of um, Constantine, especially Constantius II, were um, were Arians. They thought that Christ was subordinate, but by the end of the fourth century, you start getting some other councils. The council of you get Constantinople, you get Chalcedon, and at these they they really refine the terminology so that what we what the definition of the Trinity is comes into formulation in this later period, not at the Council of Nicaea. And people, most people, most Christians don't understand the do- doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine is a specific. It's a specific way of understanding the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in relationship to each other. Mm-hmm. It isn't. People tend to think that if you if somebody mentions Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. That is not the Trinity. Uh, those three figures are in the Trinity, but the doctrine of the Trinity is that those three are equal. Yeah, they're made of the same substance. They are different from each other. There are three persons that are all equally God, but there's only one God. That's the doctrine. <laughs> one <laughs> God, but three persons that are distinct and all equally God. And you say, yeah, well, that math don't add up. <laughs> yeah, that math don't add up, but that's the doctrine. Uh, and he's right. This does not come about uh, during Constantine's reign. Constantine never even thought about that one. But it, it does become the doctrine at the end of the uh, at the end of the fourth century. Yeah, I remember when I was a Christian, that we 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 spent a lot of time with pretzel logic trying to make all that make sense. You know, you've yeah. got, you've got ice and water and what's the other one? Uh, vapor. The, vapor. Yeah. yeah. And you've got three parts of an egg. You've got the shell, you've got yep. the white, you got the yolk. Yep. <laughs> yep. I had the same ones. You know, you have the toaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there there are all these analogies that people had. And the thing is, if you press any of those analogies, they're all a heresy. Of course. <laughs> because you end up, you always end up with either one or with three. And the whole point of the doctrine of the Trinity failure. is that you can't figure it out. Yeah. If you if you think you've got it figured out, then you've got it wrong and you're a heretic. So don't so it's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's a mystery of God. Oh, well, one all of God is a mystery, except God. the part that they know specifically. <laughs> That's right. Because yeah. God revealed that to them, right? Anyway. Uh there's another um, super chat from Greg Markaski. If you got time, I I just saw. I can do one more, yeah. One more. Okay. All right. I missed this one. Here we go. I always hoped that Mary Magdalene actually was Jesus' wife. What is the evidence for and against this thought? I enjoyed reading the Gospel of Mary. So I'll let um, you go just, after this, Doctor Roman. Yeah, well, so I uh, so I have a podcast as well called the uh, Misquoting Jesus uh, mm-hmm. Podcast. That, Highly uh, recommend, by the way. Dealt, I, well, thank you. That, it dealt with this dealt with this very issue this week. <laughs> My this week's podcast was on this issue. Was uh, Jesus married? To Mary Magdalene, and um, the answer is no. <laughs> What's the evidence for it? The best evidence for it is uh, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, <laughs> which says, "Yeah, right, right." <laughs> that's the best evidence. Um, so here's the reality that uh, I won't give all. I won't talk about the whole thing, but I'll, I'll say a couple things. One is 
people do tend to think of Mary Magdalene as one of the really important disciples or maybe even the most important disciple in Jesus' life. And again, it's because they haven't really read the Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you look at uh, what happens in Jesus' life before, the, before his crucifixion, just everything before the crucifixion, in all the Gospels, Mary Magdalene is mentioned, mentioned in one passage. Hmm. She um, is she and a woman named jo- Joanna and a woman named Susanna and a group of other women are accompanying Jesus and his disciples and providing them with, with the finances they need. That's it. That's it. That's it. So, so um, the, where Mary Magdalene becomes important. So, you know, they're not hanging out. They're not, he, she's not the most important disciple. She's not even mentioned as a disciple. They're not, they don't have an intimate relationship. They don't get married. They don't have babies. There's not, this is just made up. Yeah. Um, and so the, um, and in my podcast, by the way, I talk about the gospel of Mary and the gospel of Philip that people talk about that I show that, you know, uh, th- these actually don't, don't show anything like this, but, uh, the reason Mary Magdalene is important uh, actually makes her extremely important because in all four Gospels, she's one of the women who discovers the empty tomb. Right. And in jo- the Gospel of John, she's the first. She's the first to discover the empty tomb. And she tells the disciples, if Mary is the one who finds the tomb, and if she's the one who tells the disciples that Jesus is raised from the dead, you can make a very, you can make a plausible argument that Mary Magdalene started Christianity. Mary mm. Magdalene started, she was the first Christian, the mm. first to proclaim the resurrection. Mm-hmm. So she's the founder of Christianity. That's big. But the fact that she's the founder of Christianity, or if it is a fact, it, if she is the founder of Christianity, it doesn't make her Jesus lover. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, she no, that's founded a, that's a stretch. But every, everybody says, well, yeah, but every Jewish man had to be married, right? Everybody thinks this. And it's just nuts. Think about it for a second. In the ancient world, every society had more women in it than men. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, had more men in it than women, except yeah. in times of war. In times of war, men would be killed en masse. But if you're not at war, women uh, always, there, there are always fewer women uh, than men. Why? Because women die in childbirth right. frequently. So there are more men than women. So not every man can be married. <laughs> it's just impossible if you're monogamous, as Jews were. And we know of a lot of Jews in Jesus' day who were unmarried, and they're all apocalyptic Jews predicting the end's going to come, the ones we know about, uh, wow. the members of the Dead Sea Scroll community, the Apostle Paul. You just kind of go down yes. the list. and Yeah. Wow. The end's coming, so don't get married. That's what they said. That's what Paul says. That's probably oh, what Jesus man. said. Hmm. Interesting. That's so cool. Okay. <laughs> Good stuff. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, we're about out of time. Thank you, Dr. Ehrman, for joining us. This was very fun. Um, real quick, uh, if you're not subscribed to Dr. Ehrman's uh, blog and his website, I highly recommend it. It's like the cost of a cup of coffee, not even, like once a month. What's it like? I I've been subscribed to your blog for like the past three years. It's like two dollars a month. Yeah. It yeah. it's it's insanely worth it, you guys. It's like better than a Netflix subscription. Do it. Well, um, and the blog, let me say, you know, that the, for that membership fee, I, I don't get any of the money. Um, I give all the yeah. money to charities dealing with mainly dealing with hunger and homelessness. Um, last year we brought in over five hundred thousand dollars. And so, oh, um, good, I would, good job, man. Well, thanks. I, I've been doing it for 11 years now and I, people should just look, just look up Bart Ehrman blog and they'll, they'll see. It's, it, it's nuts. Like the, the content you, you provide on there is so worth it. Like you, you devote so much of your time into that. It's nuts. Like you volunteer that time and it all goes to homeless ministries no, so I deal with everything on the New Testament, early Christianity, you know, Roman everything. religion, whatever. Just you whatever. Can, you can search up a certain topic. You can bookmark your what interests you. It's it's so cool. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend. Uh, so 
Thank you, Dr. Ehrman. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Let's yeah, see. thank you, Bart. It was it was great meeting you here. Uh, you you had a huge impact on me. You've had a huge impact on so many. So thank you for continuing to shine the light on on the nonsense, in my view, of Christianity, and for exposing the holes that are in it. Well, thanks, Dave. And I just want to say, Dave, good luck to you. I, I hope uh, you know. I I know you. You're sick, and it's uh, and it's very tough. But uh, I Thank send you. you my send you my best and uh, my happy thoughts. Thank you. Appreciate I'd send you that. many prayers if I prayed, but I don't. <laughs> so I'm going to send you many happy thoughts. And in my well, experience, they actually work just as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to say they're just the same. <laughs> but Thanks, you so you best type of humor, so go for it. Yeah, yeah. And, so right. and Ricky, Thanks, thank you for this. This has been fun. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, Doctor Herman. We'll see you next time. All right. All right. Fun hey, stuff. Dave. Did you enjoy that? That was great. Yeah. He's a wealth of information, man. Oh, he's so he's so cool to talk to. He's, like, yeah, very knowledgeable and, and he's very, like a down to earth. Yeah, he's, he's very like approachable. A, he's like a rock star that you like you idolize and you meet and you're like, oh, he's just he's a normal guy. He Absolutely. just knows a lot about this one thing. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, and it's, but other other than that, he's a normal dude. He is indeed. Well, that was fun, man. Thanks for having me on, and uh, I enjoyed getting to to chat with him a little bit. That was cool. Yeah, but I can do that. Um. So yeah, next week uh, we were are we are going to be at the American Atheist Convention. Yeah, so, we'll be uh, there. Anybody that's going to be there, I'd love you to come by. We're going to have a table there with our nonprofit. So, where is that at again? I can't remember. What? Phil, Phil, Phoenixville? Phoenix. Nashville, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. There we go. I hope you know where to I hope you know where to go. You, no, you got to be there. Dear. I know. I know. I can tell with you. You know me better than that. I, 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 yeah. That's why I was asking. Shh. <laughs> She's keep, <laughs> keeping us straight here. But yeah, we're gonna be um, in Arizona. I've never been to Arizona. Well, I've, you can mark that off your list. Yeah, I've been to most of the states in the U.S. Arizona. Well, is a, I've never been to heaven, but I've been to Arizona. What song yeah. is that from? That's three. I'm pretty nine. sure Arizona is as far from heaven as you can get. I hope so. But <laughs> but that's why we're going there to help. Maybe maybe change that. Yeah, uh, I'll say, but yeah, it's it's gonna be a great time. Look forward to some content I plan on creating. Um, I'm gonna be delivering a speech on the polytheistic origins of Yahweh. Uh, not only does God have a wife, but He has sex with her in the Bible. Woo! Woo. Yes, it's I'm a hot take. It's a that. hot take. That's a hot take. I'm gonna talk about that. It's not weird at all. But yeah. Uh, so I'm excited about that. So thanks again, Dave, for joining you me. Bet. My pleasure, as always. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, everybody, for joining the chat. And yeah. uh, stay tuned for more shenanigans. And uh, hold on, hold on. I'm trying to I'm trying to prep my, my outro here. Don't let anybody pretend this isn't happening right now. Uh, here's a friendly reminder <laughs> that I don't know how to end shows. Hold on to your butts.